Please open your Bibles to the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 1. Our text for today is found in verses 1 through 7. Let's read through our text, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith, for the sake of his name, among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we are embarking on what I hope will be an exciting and helpful journey through Paul's letter to the Romans. This is a powerful gospel letter that has been used by God to change lives throughout the history of the Christian faith. This is something that many commentators are quick to point out at the beginning of their treatment of this letter, citing well-known examples throughout history, such as Augustine, who was a slave to sexual passion during his turbulent youth. But he had a Christian mother who prayed for him. And in the summer of 386, when he was 32 years old, Augustine went out into a garden seeking solitude where no one could interfere with the burning struggle within himself in which he was engaged. As he later wrote, I was twisting and turning in my chains. Suddenly I heard a voice from the nearby house chanting as if it might be a boy or a girl saying and repeating over and over again, pick up and read, pick up and read. So I hurried back to the place where I had put down the book of Romans, opened it, and in silence were the first passage on which my eyes lit, not in riots and drunken parties, not in eroticism and indecencies, not in strife and in rivalry, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in its lusts. Augustine writes, I neither wished nor needed to read further. At once, with the last words of the sentence, it was as if a light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart. All the shadows of doubt were dispelled. Augustine would go on to become one of the most influential believers of the first millennium of the church. And then, more than a thousand years later, A young man joined a monastery where he prayed and he fasted, sometimes for days on end, and adopted other extreme austerities. I was a good monk, he wrote later. If ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. He believed, as many do, that he had to live a righteous life in order to be saved, but felt that this was an impossible task. And so he would sometimes spend hours in the confession booth confessing everything that he could think of. But nothing pacified this man's tormented conscience until he studied the book of Romans. He struggled with the expression, the righteousness of God, because he took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is righteous and acts righteously in punishing the unrighteous. He describes a struggle in his own words, saying, night and day I pondered until I grasp the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us by faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning And whereas before the righteousness of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. This monk's name was Martin Luther. 
the German theologian who was greatly used by God in the recovery of the gospel during the Protestant Reformation. And Luther's insights into the book of Romans still bore fruit two centuries later when a man who has been described as a failed minister and missionary reluctantly went to a small Bible study where someone was reading aloud from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. This man's name was John Wesley. And he described his own experience saying that while the reader was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that He had taken away my sins, my sins, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley would go on from that experience to preach the gospel on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean during a period of revival that is known as the Great Awakening. These examples are but a few of the countless ways that God has been transforming lives through the book of Romans. And just as Paul goes on to state in chapter 1, verse 16, when he declared that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And in this letter, Paul gives us his fullest explanation of the gospel the most comprehensive and exhaustive treatment of the Christian faith in the New Testament, which we are going to be exploring over the next several months. Today, though, I simply want to unpack Paul's introduction of himself to the Romans and the greeting that we've just read in verses 1 through 7. You see, what's unique about Romans is that Paul is writing to a church that he didn't plant. And in fact, a church that he hadn't even visited before. And because of that, he opens his letter with a lengthy introduction in which he explains to his readers what it is that gives him the right to address them in the way that he does. We see this in the very first verse as Paul introduces himself in this way. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul is listing his credentials in order to show them that he's not simply a well-meaning Christian writing to them on what they should believe and how he thinks they should live, but he's writing with the authority of Christ as an apostle. First, Paul calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ, using an expression that literally means a slave. Now, now Paul isn't using that word to suggest that the gospel takes otherwise free people and then puts them into chains of bondage. The gospel actually takes people who are outside of faith in Christ, who are bondage, in bondage to their sin and in slavery to their corruptions, and it frees them. You see, we're not free apart from Jesus. Not until the light of the gospel floods into our prison of sin and gives us new life. It's not until the gospel comes and breaks our chains and opens the door for us that we begin to walk in freedom. And so the gospel sets us free from our slavery. Yet Paul still uses this expression as a slave to refer to himself in his relationship to Jesus because Paul recognized that he had been purchased by Christ with his own blood. The rescue that we experience in salvation is bought by Jesus at the cost of His own blood, at the cost of His own life, when He gave it up for us in death at the cross. And therefore, we, write, we belong entirely to Him. And so Paul rightly refers to himself as the slave of Jesus Christ because he wants to express that he realized he belonged entirely to another, that he was not his own but was devoted entirely to Jesus without any reservation whatsoever. And second, Paul describes himself as an apostle, called to be an apostle. Now, the word apostle is, is simply a word that means sent one. And, and sometimes the Bible uses it in that simple way, just to describe someone who's sent. But the Bible also uses this word in a very exclusive way to refer to 13 specific people. 
that is to the twelve apostles, which would include Judas's replacement, and to Paul. There was a very strict set of requirements in order to belong to this group. In order to be an apostle in this sense, a person had to be taught directly by Jesus Christ, learning the truth of the gospel and of the Christian faith immediately from him. And a second requirement was that they had to have seen the risen Christ. And this was the case with the twelve who walked with Jesus during his time on earth and were taught by him and who were also visited by Jesus for 40 days after his resurrection. These were requirements that the Apostle Paul met as well even though he was not among the original men who followed Jesus during his days on earth, because Paul was once a violent persecutor of the church. He was even present when the first Christian martyr was killed and gave approval to his death. Paul met the requirements of an apostle because he met the risen Christ while on his way to Damascus in order to arrest and imprison Christians when Jesus Christ showed up. He was converted that day and called by Christ. And Paul was taught the gospel directly by Jesus. The gospel that Paul proclaimed throughout the world and, and that he so clearly explained in his New Testament letters, it, it was not something that he learned from, from the other disciples or from the other apostles or from any other believer. It was something that he learned by the direct revelation of Jesus Christ and that the other apostles approved of in his life. Paul met all the requirements of being numbered among this exclusive group of the apostles, a very sacred and exclusive office that, contrary to what many people might claim for themselves today, is not occupied by anyone today. Next, Paul gives a third credential in verse 1 when he describes himself as set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was chosen as an apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles, in fact. And he had planted churches throughout the Mediterranean. And now Paul had his heart set on the West, desiring to take the gospel all the way to Spain. Paul had lived for the gospel. And he would even die for the gospel. He occupied a sacred office that he did not seek for himself, but had been chosen for him by God. And so Paul was no longer his own. He was a servant of Christ. He was called to be an apostle. And he was set apart for the gospel of God. In verse 2, Paul explains that this gospel of God is, is not a new idea. It wasn't an invention by the followers of Jesus, but was in fact that which he proclaimed beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, this is important for us to understand today because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not God's plan B for the world. It's God's plan from all of eternity, which he foretold from the very beginning throughout the Old Testament. The gospel has always been God's plan. And that's why with our eyes illuminated by the teaching of the New Testament, we're able to look back throughout the Old Testament and find it everywhere through the writings of the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In verse 3, Paul further explains that, his, that this gospel, which has been promised beforehand, is concerning God's Son. The gospel is about Jesus. He is the heart and the focus of the gospel. And, and even though the gospel affects the lives of those who believe it, transforming them forever, the gospel is not about us. It's about Jesus. And this is a simple truth, but it's a very essential one. Something that when we lose sight of it, messes us up if we forget this. I mean, just consider how in the testimony that we looked at of John Wesley... We saw a man who had pursued the ministry, a man who had given his life to serve God, even crossing the ocean to serve as a missionary in order to seek to save others, and yet he himself needed to be saved. Because he had been trying to earn God's acceptance through his own righteousness, 
through his own acts of service, much like Martin Luther had done centuries before, until upon hearing Luther's awakened insight in the preface of his commentary to this book of Romans, Wesley's eyes were opened and his heart was strangely warmed and everything changed. You see, from then on, Wesley continued to serve God as he had before, but not as he had before. It was different than it was before. He served God from that day with his heart and focus on Jesus Christ and serving out of the grace that he had received and not trying to earn it. Losing sight of this simple truth that the gospel is about Jesus, it's concerning God's Son, it still affects Christians today. And even if it's, it doesn't affect us as drastically as it did John Wesley or Martin Luther, we can go through all the motions with everything on the outside of our lives looking right. But if Christ isn't the heart and focus of our faith, inside we can feel like we're dying, we can feel empty and dark. And so it's a simple truth, but it's an essential truth that the gospel of God is concerning God's Son. Jesus is the good news. It's not what you do for Jesus, but what Jesus has done for you. And it is by abiding in His love and in His grace that you're transformed. It's by abiding in Christ that you're in the place to do things for Christ that are then born out of His grace in your life and that are, that are done for Him in faith. And when they're done that way, what you do for Him in service feels freeing to your soul and not suffocating. Paul further explains who the gospel is about in verses 3 and 4 when he shows us both the human and the divine natures of Jesus Christ, when he states that, he who was descended from David according to the flesh. You see, the Son of God took on a true human nature, just as God had foretold. In the Garden of Eden, God had said that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. He later told Abraham that through his offspring, all nations would be blessed. God eventually declared to King David that his throne would be established forever. And Jesus Christ was born of a virgin in fulfillment of God's word to crush the serpent's head, the offspring of Abraham, through whom all nations are blessed. And he is of the line of David, the promised Messiah, who reigns over an eternal kingdom, having dominion over all. And though he became a human being, though he became a descendant of David according to the flesh through the virgin birth. He didn't become the Son of God. According to verse 4, He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness by His resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be what He always was, the Son of God, but in a powerful way as He overcame sin and death for us and reigns now over us in salvation. The resurrection proves that Jesus is the Son of God in power because as He Himself had declared to the Jews in John chapter 2, when He said to them, destroy this temple, and of course He was speaking of His body, He said, destroy this temple and in, in, in three days I will raise it up again. Jesus raised up His own dead body from the grave, which He would not have been able to do if He was only a human being. And so the heart of the Gospel and the focus of the gospel is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who took on flesh, a true human nature, in fulfillment of God's promises in order to redeem us from our sins and from the consequences they deserve. And He is the Lord. This is the message that Paul's been commissioned and chosen to proclaim, having been given the authority of Christ to do so, and therefore His words are to be received to be believed and to be obeyed, which he refers to in verse 5, when he says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. 
the apostles received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name. An inherent part of the gospel message is the response that that message demands upon us. Jesus Christ is our God and our Creator. And He has come in the flesh in fulfillment of God's promises of old, foretold throughout the Scriptures in order to bear the sins of His people and take their judgment upon Himself to free us from the guilt and penalty of sin. And all this has been done so that having our sins removed from us and our hearts made alive unto God through the Gospel, we would no longer run from God in rebellion, but we would run to God in faith, desiring to please Him and to be made like His Son. And so, the apostles were not just commissioned to declare who Jesus was. They were not just commissioned to declare what He accomplished in His life and in, and in His death through in, in the fulfillment of Scripture. But they were also commissioned to declare the response God requires of us along with the result when hearts receive the gospel in faith. And that is to bring about the obedience of faith. Or, or to put that another way, to bring about an obedience that flows from faith, that proceeds from faith. Paul isn't saying here that we obey our way into salvation. Paul isn't saying that we keep ourselves in salvation by obedience either. Salvation is God's free gift to everyone who believes. It's never something earned by us. It was earned by Jesus Christ. But, whenever the gift of salvation is received by faith, that faith will be demonstrated by a new way of life. Not through a perfect obedience, not through a sinless perfection, of course, but through a Godward direction, by a lifestyle that demonstrates that Jesus Christ is present and that He is loved. And so while obedience and faith, they're, they're not the same thing. They're also not separable either. They're inseparable parts of the Christian faith because there can be no true gospel obedience where there's not true gospel faith. And there can be no true gospel faith where there's no true gospel obedience. And so part of Paul's commission as an apostle of Jesus Christ is to bring about this obedience of faith for the sake of His name because the point is the glory of God. What's this all for? It's for the sake of His name. That's what Paul lived for. That's what he died for. That's what the gospel calls us to live for. And that is what Paul wants to help these Roman believers and us as well to live for. Among all the nations, we are called to believe the gospel, to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. And then in the last two verses, Paul lists several incredible realities that are true of believers. He says in verse 6, including you, believers, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. By responding to the message of the gospel in faith, believers actually become the possession of Jesus Christ because He bought us. And like Paul, when we become His possession, we're to become His servants. We're to, we're to be those who are completely devoted to another without reservation. This is a glorious privilege that belongs to all believers because our freedom is found in belonging to Jesus. And Paul, in writing this letter to the Romans, he wants to help us understand that, to help us see that clearly and to live our lives in the reality of it, because that's our freedom. And then on top of this, Paul states in verse 7, to all those who are in Rome, who are, who are loved by God and called to be saints. Sorry, in verses 6 and 7. Paul describes the believers here as those who are loved by God. You see, God's love isn't something that you could ever earn. 
earn by your faith or by your obedience. It's not something you earn from God by being good. But the fact is that you're enabled to believe in God and you're enabled to walk in the obedience that flows from faith because you are first loved by God and have been called to belong to His Son. It begins and ends with Him. And that's such a freeing thing to realize that your faith in Jesus Christ and any obedience that flows from that faith is because you've been loved by God who's brought you into this relationship with His Son. And now you belong to a perfect Lord and Master. And seeing this clearly, it'll become our joy to give our lives in His service. And then, because we're loved by God, we're called to be saints. We're set apart by God Himself, for God Himself. We're called to be saints. We're made into God's own people. And, and He's at work in His people. He's at work in His saints to make them more saintly, to deepen their faith and to enlarge their devotion with lives that then radiate the glory of God and the grace of God at work within them as a testimony to the world of the gospel concerning His Son and of the freedom that is only found by faith in Him. And lastly, Paul writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers are the object of God's grace, His undeserved favor. And even more than that, it's not just an undeserved favor, it's an ill-deserved favor because we deserve the opposite of God's favor. We deserve God's wrath because of our sins. But in His great love for us, because we've been loved by God, He sent His Son to bear our sins, to remove His wrath from us, and to make us the objects of His favor, the recipients of His peace, making us His saints, His people who belong to His Son. These are God's gifts to us who believe. And this is also the gift of Jesus Christ to us, through whom these all come to those who believe. And this is how Paul introduces this glorious letter to the Romans in which he will comprehensively lay out for us the truths of the Christian faith, what we're to believe and how we're to live a book that has changed countless lives and will continue to change lives until the day Christ returns and we're swallowed up into the fullness of this great salvation that is ours by faith in Him. Let's pray.